So, we'll be looking at finishing up the discussion of lust. Um, sometimes people get this idea that they have a good reason to do this immoral thing because it feels right to them. See what I mean? Like, it's okay that we're having premarital sex because we're going to get married someday. So I mean, like, it, there's exceptions to the rule. Like, I, I'm, I'm able to have this special understanding with God that it's not sin because we just don't see it like that, you know. Or um, homosexuality. Well, we want to, we want to have, we want to have a family, and so God sees that that we really want to do this, and so it's okay for us, you know. We are always looking for the exception to the rule. Another example: um, cheating. It's okay that I'm cheating or looking at porn or this and the other thing because my wife just isn't there for me emotionally or whatever. See what I mean? Uh, or or the same thing goes kind of for adultery for uh, yeah any kind of adultery there, not just um, pornography. But um, there's this idea that you know it's somehow owed to me. I I somehow have this special privilege to do this thing. Um, another example is divorce. It's okay for us to get divorced because you just don't understand what a pill my spouse can be. You know, this, you know, you, you, you kind of hear um, variations of the same kind of idea just in different certain situations and circumstances. Um, and it kind of, there's this kind of this, just this attitude behind the whole thing that, that, that I am the exception as to why it's okay for me, you know. Um, so... Uh, most ma marriages are based on minor reasons. Mo the, the majority of reasons that people get married, they don't actually understand marriage, and they don't actually want to get married. It, it, let me say it in a different way. Sometimes people say things like, oh, we want to have kids, but they don't actually want to have kids. They don't want to spend the time with them. They don't want to teach them how to be an adult. They don't want to do those kinds of things. They like the idea of having kids. You know what I mean? It, it seems like a good idea, but then you actually have kids, and you start realizing it's more than a full-time job. I mean, the things that you do and don't do actually really matter, whereas at your job, if you forget to do something, I mean, it's it, hey, the bad, bad, bad thing, but it's not the end of the world. But as a parent, if you do the wrong thing, it's going to come back down the road. It's going to come back on you. It's going to come back on the society. See what I mean? <laughs> and so it's kind of a, kind of a big deal. Um and it's kind of the same thing with marriages. People people think that they know what marriage is, and, and they and they think that they're getting married for good reasons. But the truth is, most of the time people get married, they don't actually want to get married. They they think they want to get married, but they don't actually want to get married. They get married for things like attraction, for things like sex or money or fulfillment or procreation or whatever. But these are all minor issues of getting married. Like, marriage in and of itself, it's a good – what is it that Mock says? It's a blessing and a curse. You know what I mean? It's it's something that you shouldn't go into lightly. You should seriously consider what it is and what it isn't. Because a lot of people think that, you know, some people watch Disney movies and they think that that's marriage and true love. And other people, you know, they they, watch, they listen to music and that's that's true love. And, and most frequently it's not really how it is though. Marriage is about – more of what can I give into this person than what can I get. And I think that's why all these things are minor issues, or minor reasons, is because they're all kind of focused on me. Am I attracted to the person? Uh, I need a sexual outlet. Uh, I need uh, stability with, with, with money and whatnot. Uh, I need fulfillment. I need you know to have kids to make myself feel happy or whatever. And uh, marriage... The real reason for marriage is to advance God's kingdom and for the welfare of ourselves and our future partner. It's supposed to be a win-win-win situation. It's it's a win in, in, in the first sense with God's kingdom that that this is going to help you stay on course for what God has planned out for your life. It's going to help you fulfill to a greater degree what God has planned for your life. It's going to help you find contentment in your life. That's just – you're not going to be happy in, in, in your marriage if you're only getting married for other people, you know, like arranged marriages. You, you can make it work, but ultimately it's going to be harder for you to find any kind of contentment. Um, same thing as if, if you marry out of, out of what you feel is duty or obligation. I'll give you an example of this. One of my, one of my friends had um, gotten a girl pregnant, and so he married her. Um, and it turns out that she was lying about the pregnancy. At, at, which, by the way, that happens a lot, you guys. It happens a lot. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many times people lie about that. But anyways... Um, 
you know, and so then there was always this kind of friction between them. You know, he, he kind of despised her for, for manipulating him into marrying. And uh, she was always real insecure because just the whole the whole series of events. And uh, just ugly. Anyways, um, so and then uh, so for your own welfare and for, for God's kingdom, but then the last one, for your futures, for, I mean for your partner's future. You know, is you marrying this person going to – are you going to be able to help them, to lift them up, to encourage them, to grow them as a person? So, I mean, I'm not saying change them. I'm saying be there for them. Because marriage is about what can I give to this person, not what can this person give to me. See, if you actually think about it, most people don't want that when they get married. See what I mean? Um, hey, this chick is hot, and I don't want to lose her, so I guess I'll marry her. See what I mean? Or um, this guy's real mature, and he seems you know, real responsible. I think that he'd be a good choice. See what I mean? Things like that. It, it, it's 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 has this just this hollow idea to it. And uh, but anyways, um, with that being said, sometimes people kind of make up. Experience. Excuses to not give proper attention to their marriage, um, you know, like they'll be in a fight and they'll be like, "Well, I got to go to church because I'm more holy than you," you know. And when the truth is that attention to our marriage is obedience to Christ. See what I mean? Sometimes, in, in a marriage kind of situation, you would be forced to miss a service, for instance, in order to repair things with your spouse. See what I mean? And there's nothing wrong with that. You see what I'm saying? Because that, that is obedience to Christ. That is your service to Christ. Um, I think the Bible makes this abundantly clear. Um, so are you marrying because you need friendship or because you both have similar views, similar callings, similar ideas of the world? You see what I mean? Um, when, when you marry someone, it needs to be for things more than I'm lonely. See what I mean? Just because you're lonely, so go make friends, but don't necessarily get married. See what I mean? Um, marriage is, is something that I think is is not really understood a whole lot in today's culture. And I think that sometimes it's just too rushed. And, you know, the, there's no pressure in getting married. You don't have to get married right out of high school. You don't have to get married in your 30s. You see what I mean? Sometimes you will and sometimes you won't. I, and there's a missionary that I knew. No, his name's Kerry Malden. Uh, you, some of you guys probably know, know him. Um, and uh, he, his current, his wife, uh, he, he, they just got married a couple years ago. And, uh, you know, they, they both have the same kind of direction in life. They're both doing the, the uh, missions in India. Um, and, and they're able to help each other through the process. And they're growing together from it. See what I mean? And uh, that would be a good reason for it because he's got... Um, Is it called? Um, muscular dystrophy. Yes, I was gonna say cerebral palsy, but it's that one, uh, muscular dystrophy. Yes, and uh, and uh, so obviously it's gonna be harder for him to not have someone there to help him, you know. Um, and then also in the process, he's able to be the spiritual leader that she needs too. So they both they're both able to to be, grow and be encouraged by it. That that's a great example of of a marriage that that is based on good reasons and is for a good end. Um, but a lot of times, especially in today's society, you see people just hooking up with people because they feel like they have to do it to, have, to be content in life. You know, you can't possibly be single and happy. You just can't. Um, I, you know, it's on all the TV shows, it's in all the songs. You know, you have to be having either sex or, or heading towards sex. Either way, you're not going to find any contentment in life without that, those two things. And it's like, okay. Um, but I will say this: If you're going to be be single, be single, and if you're going to be married, be married. But what people try to do is they try to like they try to play the martyr card. You know what I mean? I'm married, but I'm not enjoying it. I'm going to complain about it the whole time. God, this woman that you gave me, you know, or these other people who who stay single and the whole time they're complaining about, it, you know, God, remove my passions from me. God, uh, uh, you know, that I wouldn't uh, have problems with this anymore. And it's like, well. God made us as sexual beings, you know what I mean? We need to decide what we want to do. You know what I mean? Is God calling us to a married life or to a single life? And then we need to embrace that. See what I mean? Because the only thing that's going to be found through complaining is more more complaining. It's not going to make you settled in life. It's going to make you less settled in life. So be thankful whatever, whatever your course in life and uh, stick and say the course, you know. 
Um, we talked about this uh, either last week or the week before about how some people are called to be single and some people are called to be married. And, uh, and that's really something to consider. And then, like, once again, I want to go back to this last point here. Is this person a Christian? Or are they going in the same direction as you? You know, it, it, for instance, are they wanting to be a race car driver and you're wanting to be a pastor in Minnesota? So you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> well, you probably should rethink this because your two callings are going to be always in conflict and then one of you guys is going to have to budge. Or sometimes what happens is both of you have to budge. And then there's this resentment that grows. And there's this, there's this quiet um, uh, displeasure in life that kind of nestles underneath where, where you don't even realize it for the first couple years of marriage and then just kind of comes out, you know. And so, uh, really, and then another thing that I see is, is some people feel like they, if they're single, they feel like they immediately have to go to another relationship. You know, I see this happen a lot with people who get divorced. You know, the, mar the marriage ends, so they immediately go out and look for somebody else. It's like, calm your jets. <laughs> Things can be gone to deliberately and intentionally. You don't have to keep falling in love with people. Um, so, this is an imbalanced structure of how relationships can, can form. It starts off with the physical. You find someone physically attractive, and so you overindulge in, in intimacy without um, um, commitment growing at the same time. Remember the, remember the love commitment triangle we did last week? Um, the, the, the intimacy goes sky, sky high, but the commitment's down here. So obviously, as that foundation grows, it's going to have... Think of it like this. You're building a house, and you start laying the, laying the foundation, but you don't smooth out the dirt before you laid the foundation. And then you start standing walls over here before you've laid the full foundation over here. See what I mean? And so then you try and put up the drywall. Well, none of this is going to come, come together. It's just going to be a mess. And that's the exact same kind of thing when we start off, off any relationship with the physical. Is things start growing with intimacy, but nothing's growing with the commitment. We're just made for each other. You don't understand. We understand each other. I'm, I'm glad that you feel like you're emotionally connected to this person, but calm down with the physical or else you're not going to have something that lasts. So then uh, physical, then the mental. Well, we just kind of agree with agree on things. We think the same way about things. This is a good thing, of course, but once again, these things are all out of imbalance. And then the spiritual is like an afterthought. You know what I mean? Oh, I've been sleeping with this guy, and it turns out he's not even a Christian. Well, I mean, you're sleeping around with a guy, so... <laughs> but with that being said, you know, I know people make mistakes, but, um, you know, <laughs> you don't just sleep with people. It's, it's sex is supposed to be the consummation of a love. And once again, I, I cannot overemphasize this. I know the culture is so preoccupied with sex, but sex is a very small part of marriage. Very small part of marriage. And it only lasts for a little bit. Think of it like this, okay? In your marriage, you wake up with the person, you, you, you live your life with the person, you do all the different things with the person, you, you orient your life around these people. How long does sex last? On average, it only lasts like, what, 30 minutes? Sometimes people go on for hours, but usually that's not the case. We're talking about like a, a, a top notch of 30 minutes. Usually it's downward from there on a regular basis in a married situation. So take that 30 minutes as compared to the whole day that you're going to spend with that person. It's a very small part of a 24-hour period. And if you're married, you're probably not going to have sex every day anyways. See what I mean? Because you start realizing that sex isn't as important as you thought it was before you got married. So this is a more healthy, balanced way that a relationship could develop. First off, first off it starts off with the spiritual. There is something there to grow. Through prayer, through interaction, you have a, you have a mutual bond, and it's Christ. And through that mutual bond, you're able to grow, you're able to mature. Um, and this leads on to other things. Do you mentally connect? Are, are, you, are you on the same level? You don't have to be the same. That's actually a bad thing if you marry someone just like you because you're going to start arguing with yourself about stuff. You know what I mean? You, it's okay to have someone who's nothing like you. That, that's all right. You don't have to find a clone. Um, also, I would also I would, uh, throw this word of warning out, out. When you get out from a serious relationship, don't look for someone who's just like the person that you were just with. Because it's going to go, look like something like this. You're going to break up. You're going to be heartbroken. You find somebody else, and you're like, oh, I like this and this and this about them. Well, yes, but that's kind of a bad idea. You see what I mean? Maybe that wasn't such a good a good thing. Plus, you need to appreciate the person for who they are. In a marriage and out of a marriage, you need to appreciate the person for who they are. So then, um, your spirit, spiritually, you guys connect. Mentally, you guys connect. That leads to the last factor. Physically, do you guys connect? Because you don't want to get with someone who, who's... Physically, you find it appalling. 
That's a bad case for a marriage. You want to be attracted to the person. However, it's not the f it's not the first thing, but it is an important factor in the process. Um, um, so just a few notes here. Uh, to love your partner, you must love yourself. And when I say love yourself, I'm not saying your world has to revolve around yourself. Okay, That's just being prideful. That's being uh, greedy. That's being lustful. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying you have to accept yourself for who and what you are. Do you know what I mean? Because inner conflict makes outer conflict, and outer conflict makes inner conflict. If we do not have peace in here, we are not going to have peace out here. And if we don't have peace out here, eventually it's going to trickle on into here. Do you know what I mean? People like to make it out as though um, we can be at war with someone and our thinking isn't changed. And that's just not true. When we're at war with somebody, our thinking changes. Pastor put it like this. He brought up Bill Clinton's affairs when he was in office. And he, he brought up the thing that people came to the conclusion that it really didn't matter because that didn't govern his ability to lead. And then he made this comment, but it does matter because who we are behind closed doors is going to come out, and that's going to affect the way that we lead. So it really did matter that Bill Clinton was an adulterer. It did matter. That changes the way you think. It changes the way you act. Do you know what I mean? Immorality breeds immorality. So um, – also, you have to you have to truly love God. I'm not talking about trying to earn God's love. I'm talking about where your life revolves around God, and and and, and you're happy with that. See, what I mean, when you're in that kind of a place, you're in a healthy enough place to love someone else. Because when you when you marriage when you marry someone, it's your responsibility to take care of that person. You know what I mean? And it's their responsibility to take care of you. It's it's this equal thing you guys got, got going on. It's just a big thing that we, nobody should ever enter into lightly. Um, so if there's co family conflict, you have to decide, is this something that I really want to throw my family away for? Because if there's family conflict before the marriage, it will be afterwards. That's something you have to come, come to grips with. Is this person worth that? Is this person worth losing my friends? Am I willing to throw away everything that I've built throughout the course of my life for this person. Well, they just don't understand us, or maybe they see the person with clearer eyes than you do. Um, also, the you know, kind of the idea of wrong love. This idea that instead of serving somebody, it's all about the feelings. Oh, well, I fell out of love with this person. Well, you can't fall out of love with somebody. It's a, it's a choice. Um, uh, feelings may come and go all the time. They go with anything, but Love is a, is a distinct choice. Um, you can write it out, whatever. If you're married, if you're single. Um, and you also hear people say stuff like, we just don't love each other anymore. We don't fit. We don't mesh. Whatever. Here's the thing, though. You never will because you're two different people. There will always be things that seek to separate you. But you can make something. You can, you can work together and you can make something. And when you make that marriage, it's something beautiful. It's something worthwhile. It's something that you can actually enjoy. Um, just don't ever get the idea that, hey, one day we're going to have this awesome marriage and we won't have to do any work. People have awesome marriages because they, they work at it. So warnings on divorce, uh, it doesn't end the hurt. We talked about this last week. D divorce is not going to end the hurt that you feel. In fact, you're just going to go to somebody else to try and fill it, and it's going to eventually cause you to uh, have the exact same problems with that, with that current person, and God's going to keep bringing people by to help you grow that character until eventually you learn. And once again... If you haven't healed from the hurt, you're going to be blinded from your hurt, and so you're going to go into a similar situation because you don't see that you're in a similar situation. This is why you see people go from abusive relationships to abusive relationships. Um, it de um, not because you have had enough, fallen out of love, fallen in love with another, etc. These are not reasons for divorce. In fact, everywhere the Bible talks about divorce, it says that you have the option of divorce. It doesn't ever command divorce. It just says this is grounds. God is giving you permission to do it. He's not giving you command to do it. Um, for instance, I, I've said about how the way that sometimes people get divorced because of their spouse cheating. God does allow that, but that's not necessarily a reason to. You know what I mean? You, you might want to still try and make it work. Uh, it's a big reason for divorce, you see. Another thing you see is, is fighting over things like money and whatnot. But anyways, uh, see, there was another thing I wanted to say with that. Um I said the thing about that. 
Oh yeah, abuse. And I talked about this last week. For 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 an abusive kind of situation, I never say get divorced, but I do say that that space is a good idea. You know, especially when there are kids involved, you don't want to subject them to that. And the worst reason for subjecting a child to abuse is using something like this. Well, God hates divorce. Yeah, I agree with you, but He also hates innocent children being abused because of your decisions in life. You see what I mean? Like. That's not really a good grounds for that. And so what people try and do is they try to try to beat people up because they're getting a divorce or because they've ha half had a divorce or whatever. And the truth is people who have had divorce still have feelings and they're still sexual beings. And we need to be understanding about that. Um, divorce is like removing a lung. It's not something that's quick and easy. It's something that's, that's a long, drawn-out process. It, it wearies you. Um, even if you knew it was coming, your your finances get depleted, your, your emotions get depleted. It's just a bad thing all around. And then also there's a thing that God can save any relationship. It doesn't matter how bad the hurt is. God is able to save relationships. Um, and God always desires for healing. And in any situation, God always desires for healing. Um, you can say it's guaranteed that that's the, that's the outcome that God desires to see. Obviously, you know, things aren't that black and white with divorce, but still. Divorce is a last resort for when staying would be more destructive. Is it going to be more destructive for you and that other person and God's kingdom if you stay together? This is a good reason for a divorce. You know what I mean? Like, let's say, for instance, you're married to someone and they cheat on you once, and then they come to you and they apologize, and, and you're trying to move forward, and I just can't move forward from it. Well, you need to, though. See what I mean? You, you need to try and make things work as, as much as it's up to you. Um, but with that being said, if you have had a divorce, there is hope for your life. God can bring healing. I already kind of said that. I always discourage divorce, but I realize things aren't black and white. Things are never that black and white. Um, I, have, I have one friend... Um, who his wife just up and left one day and took the kids, and that was the end of it. I mean, he didn't even know it was coming. Uh, I'm not saying there's, you know, situations where necessarily there's one person all at fault. Um, sometimes, though, it does seem like there's one person who's not willing to make it work. Um, yeah. Things really aren't that black and white. My plea is for your heart to be right, even if the situation isn't. No matter what life brings at you, you can always make sure that your heart is good before the Lord. You know what I mean? That it doesn't have bitterness in it, that it doesn't have uh, envy and strife and all these different things that just tear yourself apart. Because remember, if there's inner conflict, there's going to be outer conflict. Um, so my plea is for your heart to be right, even if the situation isn't. Remarriage is possible, but don't rush and don't and do it with prayer. Remarriage is possible. Um, I know there's been a lot of controversy on this. We talked about it last week, um, and so uh, remarriage is definitely a thing that that can happen again. But the problem is the attitude that happens in a remarriage. If you get divorced for the purpose of marrying this other person, that's obviously going to be a sin. You know what I mean? Because it's it's based out of lust. You've broken a bond that was before God. When that's a one-person bond, it's not something that they're just throwing away. Um, you know, it, well, I, I think that that kind of goes goes good. But anyways, there are some situations where, when there's there's nothing you can do about it, divorce is going to happen. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If there's a Christian, someone who gets saved, and their partner is not, not a Christian, and they and if they want to make it work, the Christian should try everything they, they, they can to make it work. That's covered by God's grace. However, if the person says, no, I'm done with you, I'm leaving – the Christian is under no obligation. He, they're okay. So I mean, it's something that, that God allows special privileges, like stuff like that. Um, and about remarriage, all that Jesus was really talking about was he was talking against the culture's way of just constantly divorcing and remarrying. He was emphasizing the specialness of, of marriage, and uh, so marriage shouldn't just be gone into lightly. But at the same time, we shouldn't try and um, tear people apart because they've had a divorce, because people who've had a divorce are already torn up. With that being said, also. Remarriage is an option for a lot of people, once again, depending on if the situation is right. Um, and so what we need to worry about as a church is we need to worry about um, picking people back up after they've already fallen. Um, do you know people don't need us to tell them how stupid their their life decisions are? Most of the time they know. <laughs> like, ah, that was a mistake. The problem is that we allow our feelings to go in front of us, don't we? So we make the same stupid mistake because we allow our feelings to go before us. The same is oftentimes we talk down to people who've had divorced or want to get remarried because we're talking from where we are. 
I mean, where marriage is supposed to be one and done. Yeah, that's the ideal. I agree with you. But sometimes it doesn't work like that. See what I mean? Sometimes people rush into a marriage before they fully thought it through. Sometimes people base a marriage off of the physical rather than the spiritual. And, and as a result, it just causes everything afterwards to just be insecure and crumbly. But enough of that. So that brings us to the idea of fidelity, a, a vow of fidelity. A vow of, of – remember how we talked about the vow of simplicity with greed, remember? That we're not going to be mastered by anything. We're just going to – we're going to give stuff away. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna, to um, transfer ownership from us, <clears throat> from us to God. We're going to just kind of change our mentality on it. Well, with lust, we need a vow of fidelity. Um, what does fidelity mean? First off, it means we affirm our sexuality. Whether single or married, we affirm that we are sexual beings. That's not an excuse to sleep around. That's not an excuse to – you know, look at porn. That's not anything like that. But it is an excuse to get friends. We are sexual beings and we need people to talk to. We need people to relate to, people to communicate with. Um, and that's part of our sexuality. Remember, sex is a very small part of our sexuality. So whereas we're affirming our sexuality, that's not necessarily I'm giving you free license to go and sleep with people. Um, fidelity means a loyalty to calling. If you are called to be single, staying true to that. If you're called to being married, staying true to that. Um, sometimes people rush into marriage and, and they, they realize their mistake, and so they try to correct it, and they think divorce is somehow going to correct it. This is how my view is. If you're married to someone that you don't like, learn to like them. If you're not married to someone, don't rush into a marriage. I mean, it's that simple. You know what I mean? Um, if you're sleeping with someone, we talked about this last week and the week before, either stop having sex with them or get married. You know what I mean? It, it, there's there's only those two options. You you cannot keep having an immoral immoral lifestyle. And uh, so stay true to your calling. If you if you if you're called to be married, be married. If you're called to be single, be single. Um, Paul put it like this: that you shouldn't seek to be something else. Just be what you are. And see what I mean? And if the situation comes where, where you just can't hold back your lust, then get married. And if that doesn't enter into the equation, don't worry about it. Um, uh, it means directing sex only in the God-given covenant of marriage. Remember, sex itself is not a bad thing. Sex with no restrictions is the bad thing. So in fidelity, we make the decision that we're going to accept sex in its proper course. So um, to commit yourself to the well-being and growth of each other. Even in the face of divorce, it's a hard thing to, to be in the middle of a divorcing someone and still do things for their best interest. That's a hard thing to do because divorce at its root, Jesus talked about this, divorce at its root usually has the attitude of bitterness, you know, hard-heartedness. Um, and with that, it's hard to look out for someone else because with heart of, hardness of heart, you kind of only think about yourself. Uh, your emotions get all jungled up and you just get confused. Um, anyways... Um, Fidelity means mutuality. It means that I'm not going to lord it over my wife. My wife is not going to be uh, disrespectful towards me. We're gonna we're gonna meet together and we're gonna um, we're gonna talk it out. Hey, do we both want to be in charge of finances? Do you want me to do the finances? What do you want to do? We're gonna decide and decide before we make major purchases. We're gonna um, find our sexuality fulfilled in our spouse. Um, and we talked about this. If the situation comes where where something's preventing us from having sex. We'll only use masturbation for limited times, and if we think about anything, it's only going to be our spouse. Um, remember, we were talking about that—the uh, idea that that you're in it, you're in it to win it, you're in it for the long haul. You know, the marriage is something that ends when you die, ideally. Um, it means honesty and transparency. It means you're not going to hide stuff and, and lie to your partner. You're not going to um, constantly do stuff behind their back. You're not going to make them wonder, "Am I going to have to worry about what they're doing?" I mean, you, your spouse shouldn't have to be concerned and, and not able to trust you. Um, the only exception to that that I would say is sometimes um, you need to be aware of your spouse's background. If they come from a background of porn, if they come from a background of cheating, you need to be aware of that. And it's not necessarily that you don't need to trust them, but you don't need to be naive. You know what I mean? Well, my spouse who has a history of this is showing signs of distancing himself or herself, showing signs of getting back into that rut. So, I mean, don't don't be stupid. Don't be stupid, stupid. Who's seen Arrested Development season four? Maybe. Uh, there's this part where this character Job is talking to this, <laughs> to this girl. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's just funny. Anyways, uh, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, but so your spouse shouldn't have to go behind your back, and that should always be a, be a factor whenever you make any decisions. But with that being said, um, trust your spouse, but uh, don't be naive. <clears throat> Explore spirituality together. Fidelity means that you're going to make an extra effort with your spouse to connect with each other, to um, grow spiritually together, to, to move forward. You're, you're going to make the effort, even if they've hurt you, even if you've gotten in fights, even if you know divorce has been brought up, even if there's been adultery or cheating, even if whatever. You're making the equal decision together. You're going to try and make this thing work to the best of your ability. Um, and with that being said, most marriages could be saved if the two people were realizing what they were entering into and made the conscious decision to make it work. Majority of the times that marriages don't work isn't because it's too far gone. It's because they just continually make the decision that I'm not going to put forth effort. I'm just, I'm just not willing anymore. Um, <clears throat> life without sex is possible, however. So fidelity means that it, in the context of being staying single, that you're not going to seek sexual fulfillment out from people. You know, we talk about the way that masturbation can be an acceptable thing as long as less is not involved. Um, and as long as it's not a life-dominating thing. Um, but, but with that being said, sex is still off off, uh, off, off, list, off topic, off grounds, off. What am I saying? Limits. limits. <laughs> yes, limits. Sex is still off limits. And that is, is possible, which is very hard to understand in this culture, especially like, like me, if you come from a from background in pornography. Because the culture tells us all over everywhere that life without sex is impossible. We see it on TV, we see it on movies, we see it in music. I mean, goodness sakes, it's everywhere. Or we hear it on music, rather. Um, and the truth is that life without sex is possible. It is a possibility. Uh, it's not like you're going to somehow die or anything. And people have a lot of weird theories. For instance, did you know it's completely harmless to have sex with a woman while she's pregnant? Nothing bad's going to happen. Completely harmless. Um, if you uh, do not masturbate, there's this idea that it's going to somehow cause you know this really bad stuff to happen. Uh, no, it won't. If your body needs to expel something, well, it's not. It doesn't like masturbation. Your life depends on it. You know. Uh, also, there's no there's no ill health effects by masturbating. That's another theory that people got going. That if you don't if you masturbate, you're going to get warts and all this stuff. And say that's just not true. I mean, this is not true. Uh, but anyways. Um, relationships, especially marriages, are grounded in union, not sex. In oneness, not sex. I know sex is the consummation of, of you know, two flesh. It's, it's one flesh. I get that. But I'm talking about more the way that relationships, sex doesn't make, they, doesn't make relationships work. Sex adds a dimension to relationships. Relationships are bounded on two people uniting together. Do you know what I mean? Current, uh, similar ideas, similar similar goals in life, these kinds of things. It's not not based on sex, um, and so you can have friendships with male and female people, um, and it just nothing will have been lost by not having sex. So, um, uh, encourage one another in the Lord. That that's that's really the essence of fidelity. And with that, I mean compliment people. Have you ever seen a single single seen a single person who you complimented and their lights, their eyes just light up. Have you guys ever seen that? Uh, because we're sexual people. We like to know that, that people appreciate it, that, that people see us for who we are. We like to know that that, 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 that we're worth something. You know what I mean? And I know the argument, oh, well, we shouldn't have to because you should find your belonging in Christ. Yeah, I get that. I really do get that argument. However, with that being said, we are still sexual beings and we need that validation. Um, touch. You know, I'm not talking about dirty ways. I'm talking about just, you know, patting on the shoulder, hugging, you know, some kind of, of uh, physical affirmation for the person. Um, obviously, you don't want to push this too far with opposite sexes if you're, like, attracted and that kind of stuff. And even if you're not attracted, just kind of a messy situation there. But, you know, uh, young girls could do it to young girls, you know, for instance. You know what I mean? It just things like that to just validate someone, just giving them a pat on the, on, on the shoulder. You know, you don't have to do anything explicit or anything. Uh, you know, just little, little affirmations like that. Uh, or here's another one that, that's a great way to encourage each other in the Lord. doesn't require any physical intimacy. Make time for one another. 
when you just make the time to go and talk to somebody. And you know, sometimes people are just lonely. And some, in fact, sometimes people get married because they're lonely. And they think somehow that's going to fix it. And so their, their loneliness just carries into marriage. I will say this. If you struggle with something outside of marriage, you're going to bring it into marriage. Whether it's pornography, loneliness, anger, whatever. It's going to follow you. Um, so do everything you can to bring healing to the person. That would be the definition of encouraging someone in the Lord. Um, obviously the idea of submitting to one another as well. Um, that there's there's an equal appreciation um, in the church and out of the church, you know, there's just that that appreciation of peoples. Um, so, <clears throat> don't look for excuses. I cheated on my spouse because they fill in the blank. This is uh, this this is giving yourself an excuse. I mean, we already talked about this at the beginning of the lesson, but I kind of want to show you more specific examples. We got divorced because they. There's just certain red flags that you need to pay attention to. And when you start sentences off like this, you can be assured that somehow, somewhere, you're wrong. See what I mean? Even in, in the situation of my friend with the divorce, very few times, I don't know the situation. I don't want to know the situation. See what I mean? I feel like that's none of my business. I really do. I, I feel like knowing the situation wouldn't help me be a good friend to him at all. At all. I feel like the only reason why I would want to know is for nosiness, and I'm not really that nosy, so I really don't care. You know what I mean? He needs someone who's a friend. He doesn't need someone who knows all of his life's, life's problems. Um, but with that being said, the grand majority of divorces – in fact, let me rephrase that. Every divorce that I have ever personally gotten the details on and seen, it has never been one person's fault. Maybe it started by one person, but then the other person just kind of did some of the egg did along. You know what I mean? Uh, but anyways… Um, I can't. I don't talk to my parents because they, you know, my my parents were the world's worst parents, so I can't possibly forgive them. Um, I will. Do what? Your <laughs> right? <clears throat> I wasn't wrong because they. We use this one a lot. Um, I may have lost my temper, but they. Okay. Either you either you do the right thing or you don't do the right thing, but don't make it somebody else's problem that you didn't do the right thing. Um, so then, in, in marriage specifically, we have an excuse um, where something is allowed to, to develop that, that eggs on towards divorce, and it's not a, not addressed at all. On one side, there's marital rape that you, that your spouse has to give themselves to you every single time that you desire, regardless of whether you've had fights, regardless of whatever, and you can just ravish them. You know what I mean? You can just utterly destroy them in the bed because hey, they're your partner. This is called marital rape. It's been condoned for a long time in the church, and I hope that that stops in, in the very near future because that's not okay. Marriage is supposed to be a mutual affirmation of love. Yes, it is true that not every time that your spouse wants to have sex, you're going to be really super on board. That's a true statement. Yeah, absolutely. Your spouse is going to want it sometimes, and you're just not going to be in the mood for it. However, there's a difference between, between yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do this with you even though I'm not really in the mood, you know, just to, just to kind of, you know, help us build each other up. Yeah, that's fine. And there's a difference between that and no, I don't want to do this, and then you having to guilt trip the person into it or <laughs> force the person into it. Just because you're married doesn't make that all right. That's definitely not all right. And using one or two verses yanked far out of context is not an adequate reason for raping your spouse. It needs to be a mutual affirmation of love or not at all. See what I mean? If, if your spouse doesn't have sex with you because of the way you've been treating them, Start treating them nicer, or apologize and try to make and try to make things better. And you can have makeup sex, which is even better. Hey, <laughs> you know. But anyways, um, and then on the other side, there's people being the marital distance. I'm not gonna have sex with my husband because he was a jerk to me. See, neither of those extremes are a good solution. Neither of those things are gonna build up the marriage. And the middle is 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 the correct option. Seek forgiveness in unison. When both partners come together for the purpose of building each other up and listening. See what I mean? And I'm not talking about making stupid commitments to each other. We'll we're never gonna gonna yell at each other. Okay. Well, good luck with that. But in the in the real world, though, people do lose their temper with each other. That's what people do. Um, however, you need to make twice, if not three times, the effort and reconnecting that you did in tearing up. See what I mean? 
And whenever you give one one criticism to your spouse, it takes about three or four words of encouragement to help them feel like you still love them. That's just from my own personal experience. Um, but anyways, know when a relationship is over. What I mean by this is you're dating someone and you know that it's not godly and you know it's not going anywhere. You know it's over. You have Your spouse has divorced you. Do not milk this. Yeah, you don't know how many people I've seen stalk their ex. Like, hey, maybe I, we can still make this work. We we're meant to be. And, okay, that's great. But here's the thing. Marriage takes two people, not one person. Don't stalk your ex-spouse. <laughs> I mean, some things just haven't been said, I guess. But anyways, um, but I would like to say a few more things on this before we, we, we're kind of getting to, towards the end of the lesson. Um, all things affect our marriage, our spouse, um, our future, our life, our perspective. Everything we do is going to affect that in life. We are never going to make a decision that will not have, a, have an effect. Um, we don't stop forgiving our spouse or someone because they won't change. Well, sometimes what we what, what people do in marriage or in other serious relationships or any relationship really, they get this idea that I'm not going to forgive them this time because I keep forgiving them and they won't change. They just keep doing the same thing over and over again. Newsflash, guys. You don't forgive someone so that they will change. Even if they keep doing it forever, you forgive someone because that's who you are in Christ. Understand the difference? You forgive because Christ told you to do that. Not because your spouse or your parents or whoever are going to be worthy of it. Not because they're never going to do it again. You forgive them because that's who you are. What happens is we start giving ourselves excuses to not forgive. I'm tired of putting forth the effort with someone who's just not putting forth any effort. Well, yeah, but now what you're doing, you're taking a step backwards. And you're, you're building up more walls than were there previously. Because now not only is there the wall that they put up, now there's a wall that you're putting up too. Think of it as a wall to Mexico. Mexico and America both put up two different walls. You know what I mean? It's not healthy. So, uh, we forgive them because that's who we are. Emotional adultery is the same as mental or physical adultery. I think that kind of just needs to be said. You know, you can cheat on your spouse without ever touching another woman or man. Um, you can, by, it's fi by finding emotional oneness with another person that you know is a little bit too far. I'm not saying you can't be friends with other people of the opposite sex. I'm just saying you'll know when it happens. So with that being said, be the difference you want to see. You don't like something your spouse is doing. You don't like something that whoever's doing. Be the change that you want to see. Um, so what about the church? We must see killing. We need to stop tearing people down who come into the church, and we need to, as the church, start building them up. We need to actually search them out too. You know what I mean? Um... That's why I like the food pantry so much is it's the idea of, of here we are helping you. That's it. There's no there's no special qualifications attached. We're just here to serve you. That's it. That's how every ministry that should how every member of the church, that's how every service of the church should be. Just seeking healing for people. There's something that I can do to help you, and so I'm gonna do that. Um, but what we've rather done in the past couple of years though is we we've talked torn people up because we don't agree with their lifestyle. We don't want them to think that that's okay. That's fine. I understand that that's not okay. But there's a difference between loving somebody and just giving them a hard message. So then you hear people say something real stupid like this. If you really love them, you'll give them those hard messages. Why would that ever enter your mind? So, I mean, there's a few things. First off, Paul says very clearly, what, what business do I have judging those outside of the church? He says that very plainly. But then also, let's see the people in the church. Just because something is happening and you see it doesn't mean it's, your, it's, it's up to you to say it. But if it is up to you, make sure it's God saying it and not your emotions saying it. You'll know the difference by this. Do you want to say it? Is it something that you personally have a problem with? See what I mean? I have a problem with people getting divorced. What? They're getting a divorce? God's giving me a message just now. <laughs> it just so happens that that's the exact same thing that you personally hate. See what I mean? Oftentimes not. Um, and oftentimes God will use people who don't even know the circumstance. Um, actually, last Sunday morning, I really felt like felt like there was someone uh, there that, that a message was for, and I didn't know who. And I had an idea, 
But I didn't know for certain, so I just said, look, I don't know who this is for. And, and so, I, you know, but so I told them. And when I, but here's the thing, though. Sometimes God will give you a message you know what it's for. And for that, I would say don't say it in front of people because you know who it's for. Go to the person and say, hey, I, I feel like this is from God. It might not be, okay? I'm not trying to cram this down your neck. And then you tell them, you say, now, do you feel like maybe that's for you or do you feel like I'm off base here? Because what we try to do is we try to do drive-by evangelism, right? We try to say a word from the Lord and run off. Word from the Lord. You know, that doesn't actually affect anybody. You know what I mean? That, that doesn't build people up in the Lord. And so, yes, yeah, sometimes people do need to be told of their sins. But sometimes, the majority of the times, they don't. And the majority of times, even when they do, it's not up to you to do it anyways. See what I mean? What Christians have, have done is they've advocated Christian hate speech. I'm not talking about they're talking against homosexuality. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where we are condoning Talking down to people and saying mean and hurtful things that just don't even need to be said. And then there's the idea that you keep and you, you catch more more flies with honey than vinegar. You know what I mean, sometimes you need to wait for the right time. You need to wait for the right words. And sometimes you, you can't just go and I'm just telling them how it is. And I'm just well, that's that's a that's a good idea. Never really, it's a good idea. Never. And the thing is, is we as Christians need to be smarter than that. Because not even the world is that dumb, and yet we're justifying our stupidity because, hey, we're the, we're the church. And just like Jesus said in one of his parables in Luke, he said, the people in the world are handling their finances better than the people in the church. It doesn't just apply to money either. That's that's kind of a principle. We need to be as smart as the, as the world. We don't need to be constantly be bested by the world because they're constantly outsmarting us. You know what I mean? So... Um, <clears throat> Godly actions and starting, ending, or in enduring relationships. If someone is getting married, we need to be there to give them premarital counseling. We need to be there to give them encouragement, to make sure that they're getting married for the right reasons, to make sure that they that they feel like they're making the right choice. See what I mean? Because sometimes everything can be right. It can all look right, but it's not the right choice. Uh, and in, in the book, he told a story about these two people. who Everybody said that they should get married. You know, they, they they worked great together and everything, but but they just didn't. They just had reservations. So they got, like, the pastor and some other people that they knew were spiritually discerning people. And they got them all together and they said, you know, we just need to kind of pray and talk about this and kind of see where, the, where this goes. And uh, it turns out that they were definitely getting married for the wrong, for wrong reasons. So they decided not to. They broke off the engagement. She ended up getting married to someone else that she's very happy to, happy with. And he ended up going and doing something else that... That he felt like that was the right thing. Neither of them have, have hard feelings towards it. And they didn't make a, a, a mistake in getting married too quickly to the wrong person. And once again, I've told you this before. There's not that one person out there for you. However, there are some people who are just worse decisions and some people who are just better decisions. And so sometimes when we pray, we don't need to say, God, show me this divine will, you know, this light in the sky. But not that that's wrong. You know, sometimes God does have specific things that he calls us to. Um, not getting into Calvinism, I'm just saying, you know, sometimes God will call you a specific thing like pastoring. Um, but with that being said, sometimes we need to pray for discernment as to which is the better decision. Because sometimes things look real good to us, but they might not play out like that. And it seems that God knows the beginning from the end. I think it seems better to just pray and ask God. David did this when he was in a city and said, look, God... Um, these people are coming up against this. Um, are, are, is this city going to give me up to them if I stay here? And God said, yes, they're going to do that. And he said, okay, so should I go this way? And God said, yes, you should go that way. So David ran off, and, and he was he was saved. He wasn't he wasn't captured. So I mean, and so sometimes we need to make we need to pray and seek God's guidance on dis, on decisions that we're making. Just because it's a good idea to include God in those decisions you're making, that goes for marriage or staying single or whatever. Sometimes. We've seen a lot of people that we know stay single, and we just we don't want to die alone, and we don't want to we don't want to go through that 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 tr trouble that they've gone through. So we try to just go and find a spouse as soon as we can. But then other people, they've seen a lot of bad stuff with marriages, and so they just say, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm not gonna get married." And God really wasn't a part of the decision in either of those people's lives. See what I mean? You see what I mean? I'm not saying, once again, I'm not saying that we should or shouldn't get married. I'm saying whatever we do, we should have peace that this is the right thing, and we should accept it. And move in that direction. Do you know what I mean? That makes sense. Accept the calling that God has placed on your life. Um, 
All people are sexual beings, though. Now, this is something you really have to remember. Elderly people are still sexual beings. They still have needs. Um, the sick, oftentimes we think the people with cancer or whatever, that somehow they're absolved from, from, from sexual needs, and that's just not true. Um, the disabled, uh, I'm not just talking about physically, I'm talking about mentally too. Um, oftentimes, even mentally retarded people um, know that there's stuff going on. You know what I mean? Very, very few times are they completely unaware that they have genitalia. You know what I mean? Um, that's usually not the case. And, and I know sometimes it's easier and more convenient to think of them as non-sexual beings. But as a church, we need to realize that those people are sexual beings too. Those people need fulfillment. Those people need relationships. They need, they need people. Um, and so I have one more story from the book that is a sad story, so I will try to just get through it quickly. This guy had, had his wife, and she was dying of, 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 I think it was cancer. I don't remember exactly. And so uh, he, he came and he just talked with her and everything, and, and it was seeming to go better, but he just knew that um, that she seemed a little bit heavy, so he lied down next to her, and he just kind of cuddled, cuddled on her, and they talked, and, and they shared moments, and it made it easier for her, and she passed later on that night. And he was able to help her passing be easier. See what I mean? And he was able to do that, and, and with that I want to say a few things. A... People need affirmation. They need relationships. They need fellowship. And sometimes we try and run and hide from people because they're dying or whatever, and that's scary. Or, you know, they're they're not real people. You know, they have uh, autism or what's that one? Down syndrome or, you know, so, I mean, so they're not real people. So they don't actually have feelings. And the truth is, well, no, they still need that fellowship. You know what I mean? And uh, so we need to make sure not, not to, not to, you know, ignore those kinds of people. I know some of us are more gifted in dealing with that than other people. Ben, for instance, is, is, is has a job where he, he works with, with people who aren't fully um, functional. And uh, he's, you know, got a great talent for that. I, I'm not real good with, with really talking to many people at all. <laughs> and not just mentally retarded or, or physically disabled or, or sick or elderly. I'm just not real good with people in general. And so my main thing is that I always try to just not spend time with people as much as possible. But with that being said, you, you see kind of where I'm going with that. Um, sometimes people will have, have just really, really good um, callings in there. Um, but then also I want to say another thing. Never abandon someone in their moment of need. You know what I mean? Uh, for instance, uh, getting a divorce because your spouse is going to die anyways. Or uh, n don't bother making amends with your parents because they're on deathbed anyways. You see what I mean? Sometimes, sometimes people, in order to make somebody's passing easier and, and less pain, painful and just simpler, People just need that, that connection with someone. Like that wife, I mean, I don't know if she would have still died at the same time, but that, that husband was able to put aside his insecurities in the situation, put aside his emotional difficulties in that and just be there for her as she passed. You know what I mean? That must have been a great comfort to her and helped her to just let it go. You know what I mean? And uh, so anyways, um, so lust is the indulgence without limits and, 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 and really how you fight that. Remember with greed, how you fight that is you give, you give often, you give with thankfulness, you, you, you give and, and remember that you're not, you're not the boss of it anyways. But with lust, how you overcome that is you follow God's rules. You say, hey, my life is not my own. I've been bought with a price. I'm going to live God's way, not my own. You make a conscious decision to surrender your desires. See what I mean? You, you, you make that conscious effort, and then you revolve your life around that. You stay, you take that vow of fidelity, regardless of whether you're single or married. You take, you, you, you do that honesty, that transparency, that, that loyalty, just those different things that we talked about. Um, and and that's, that's the way you overcome lust. You know what I mean? I think it's the Weight Watchers who puts the diet like this. 
rather than trying to uh, get off of everything that's causing you to be overweight, instead, I think it's Weight Watchers who says this, um, we tell you to limit those things. It's okay to have that, just have a little bit of it. And so that's kind of the idea of lust. It's, it's not, most of the things that lust gets us in trouble with isn't bad in small doses. Sex, it's not bad in small, in small doses. What's a small dose? Marriage. Uh, eating. Eating is not bad. Just don't overeat. Don't live your whole life to eat. See what I mean? These different things where, where it's not necessarily that the thing's bad. Obviously, there's other things that are just bad, like.